Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. While fighting on the Temple Mount, refugees fleeing into Europe, Pope Francis planning his visit to the U.S. are just a few of the stories we have for you today. But first we're going to start off with another massive earthquake in Chile. Now as locals in Coquimbo, Chile celebrated Independence Day, they were caught off guard when an 8.3 magnitude earthquake suddenly hit the region. Now felt in many towns across the country, people going about their everyday lives, like grocery shopping, even reporting the news, then suddenly stopping as the ground shook beneath them. Wow, well, a million people were evacuated and more than 250,000 families were left without water and electricity. Uh, Chilean President Michelle Bachelet, uh, reassuring her country, said the measures taken were taken very quickly. As soon as the earthquake occurred, the main focus was protecting the people, and so all the coastal areas were evacuated given the magnitude of the earthquake and the possibility of a future tsunami. Authorities were quick to emphasize a more efficient response than that of five years ago in the initial aftermath of the 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake of 2010. Now at that time the government misjudged the extent of damage and declined offers of international aid. Alerts also failed to warn the residents of likely tsunamis that followed, leaving many of those who survived the initial quake to be swept away by the massive waves. Wow. Well, this time, however, a few towns have been flooded, but no tsunami-like waves. One resident said, I looked and the water was already coming, but it wasn't a wave, more like a high tide with force. Uh, Bashley has visited the worst affected regions, and for now, it's the strongest earthquake to hit in 2015. Well, even though Japan and Chile are separated by almost 11,000 miles of ocean waters, tsunami waves from the 8.3 magnitude quake were felt along the Japanese coastline. Now, this coming at a time when Japan's Prime Minister, Shinsu Abe, is sending shockwaves of his own throughout the country. That's right. The Prime Minister is seeking to pass a bill changing the country's laws, which forbids the deployment of troops to assist allies who are under attack. Japan's military has kept a peaceful provision since World War II and the devastating aftermath in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Promoters or protesters, excuse me, gathered outside Japan's parliament as the controversial bill was before the upper and lower houses. Abe's Liberal Democratic Party has a majority in the lower house, but opposition parties have vowed to stand in the bill's way. They are doing whatever they can to prevent the vote from going through but a vote of censor was defeated in the House of Representatives following a brawl in the chamber the day before as opposition MPs accused the government of trying to railroad the legislation through. Well, some analysts believe what the government is doing could be unconstitutional. Uh, Masaki Ina, a law professor from the International Christian University just outside Tokyo, commented in one report. If the government wants Japan to have collective self-defense, changing interpretation of the Constitution isn't enough. The government should let the people decide whether the Constitution itself should be amended. Now he concluded by saying, if the security bill was necessary for our country, the public would have supported it. It is unconstitutional to decide these issues this way. Now, the sentiment certainly was felt as Japan saw one of the largest anti-war protests in over 50 years in the capital city of Tokyo. Literally tens of thousands of Japanese took to the streets to speak out against the prime minister's plan to draw the Japanese people into any kind of military conflicts. Mm. Well, a recent poll showed over half of the Japanese public 
opposes the changes called collective self-defense. Under certain conditions, it would allow for actual Japanese combat. Some Asian strategists say Japan is finally growing up. As many suspect, Prime Minister Abe is proposing the pushing and pushing for the changes to counter potential threats from rising powers of China and North Korea. While the United States itself has been urging Japan to expand its military role in the region, the changes could make it unavoidable for Japan's military to join in U.S.-led conflicts across the globe. Now, the protesters make it clear they want nothing to do with Abe's changes. They have their own solution. They want Prime Minister Abe to step down. Sure. One retired grandmother shouts, of course I'm angry. I want politicians to listen to the people's voice. I have children. I have many grandchildren. This fight is for them. She exclaims as they break through the police barriers and, of course, they spill into the streets surrounding the parliament and a fight to preserve Japan's pacifist past amid fears of a militaristic future. Well, turning our view now to conflicts in the Middle East region, Russia and the West are having a disagreement over how to fight ISIL in Syria. Russia says the Syrian government should lead the fight, but the U.S. insists it is opposed to any role for Damascus. Now, currently, Russia and the West are intensifying their independent efforts. Well, the U.S. and its allies, while attempting to build up rebel fighters in the region and strike the terrorists by air, have failed to deal effective blows to the terrorists. Some experts believe the growing U.S. campaign will eventually be used against the Syrian government itself. In a recent interview with Russian media outlets, President Bashar al-Assad spelled out how a political solution to the conflict in Syria will only be possible after the terrorists are defeated. He stated, the priority of every single Syrian citizen is to be secure, so we can achieve consensus, but we cannot implement unless we defeat the terrorism in Syria. He goes on to explain, we have to defeat terrorism, not only ISIS. I'm talking about terrorism because you have many organizations, mainly ISIS and al-Nusra, uh, that are announced as terrorist groups by the Security Council. Assad cautioned the West and Turkey are supplying weapons, money, and volunteers to al-Qaeda-linked al-Nusra front and ISIL across Syria. He also noted that Iran is playing a crucial role in helping Syria fight the terrorists. Syrian president also said that Damascus does not coordinate any of its anti-terrorist strikes with Washington. I bet not. Uh, president Assad explained uh, while, why saying, he explained why, saying this is because they, and he's referring to, of course, the United States, cannot confess. They cannot accept the reality that we are the only power fighting ISIS on the ground. For them, maybe, if they deal or cooperate with the Syrian army, this is like a recognition of our effectiveness in fighting ISIS. Assad said he would only step down if the Syrian people actually wanted him to. The Syrian conflict began in 2011 and has claimed the lives of over 240,000 people so far. Extreme, extremist groups have increased in size and number due largely to support from U.S., Turkey, and some Persian Gulf Arab states in their bid to bring down the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. Now, the conflict now seems to be growing even more complicated with Russia and the U.S. sticking to their positions on the war. Well, the U.S. is reportedly ready to talk, though, and for our coverage on further developments in and around the Great River Euphrates, we now turn over to our correspondent, Larry McGee. Uh, Larry, what exactly is the U.S. ready to talk about? Secretary of State John Kerry says the U.S. believes that conversation is an important next step in addressing the issues surrounding Syria. The U.S. is reportedly in hopes that talks will take place soon with the expectation that they will help to define some of the different options that are available as America considers its next steps in Syria. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, remains critical, however, communicating to the press recently that the West needs to put aside its double standards. 
The Russian leader says there is a necessity to put aside geopolitical ambitions and the use of terrorist groups to change governments. The unpopular president stated in a meeting recently in Tajikistan that an international effort will be required to defeat terrorism and to maintain global and regional security. Moscow, he says, has proposed just such a coalition that will bring together the efforts of everyone interested in combating the threat of terrorism. And the Russian president punctuated his speech by reaffirming the Russian intention to continue furnishing military and technological support to Syria. In line with that promise, the Pentagon is reportedly on edge due to the arrival of Russian fighter jets in Syria to support the democratically elected president Bushar al-Assad. Analysts fear that this raises the prospect of U.S. and Russian warplanes in the same skies fighting on opposite sides. In addition, surveillance photos show Russian helicopters, other aircraft for transportation, tanks and armored vehicles for personnel. Secretary Kerry, addressing the situation from London, says that everyone is now and has been seized by the urgency of the moment. But the migration levels, the continued destruction and the danger of potential augmentation or increase by any unilateral or one sided moves really puts a high premium on diplomacy at this moment. In the exercise of diplomacy, the U.N. envoy to Syria, Stefan Mustura, appeared in the capital city of Damascus this week to discuss a plan of peace concerning the Syrian coup, which is now in its fifth year. Over four million people have fled the country as a result of the siege, and that and double that number are reported to be displaced within the nation. Both Moscow and Iran have provided support to the Syrian government, which they say is needed to fight the terrorism and prevent of potential catastrophe in the region. The West, however, which is firmly against all things Assad, says that the support may more than likely produce the opposite effect. The West is receiving much counter-criticism itself, however. The Russian ambassador to the UN is challenging the American assertion that the Syrian government has allowed ISIS to gain in strength. According to the Russian envoy, ISIL grew in Iraq during the U.S.'s war or intervention there, and it has spread from that point into Syria. State Department spokesman Mark Toner, in speaking about the American response to ISIS at a recent press meeting, says that the U.S. has made significant gains. Reporters, however, were skeptical and pressed the spokesman based on figures which show ISIS increasing in territory from September of last year until present. Analysts also point to America's multi-million dollar strategy of training and arming of Syrian insurgents, a strategy which many are calling a failure since a Pentagon official testified this week that for all of its millions in funding, there are only four or five U.S. trainees left to contend with the entire force of ISIS. For YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan Jeff, back to you. Katana sure seems like even with all their efforts, they still can't achieve the peace that the Syrian people are desiring. Yeah, kind of reminds me of what Yishra Hawkins said. They're like groping like blind men in the dark. Well, far-right Israeli MP Moshe Phelan uh, defied Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and entered Jerusalem's Temple Mount. Well, the holy site has been shut down to all visitors in light of recent violence there. For decades, Jews have been allowed to visit Alaska uh, Mosque, which holds significance for both Jews and Muslims, but they are not allowed to pray there. Phelan on, on the campaign to change that saying, I call the government, I call the prime minister to change this attitude and to open the mountain to every Jew who wants to come in a peaceful way to pray to God at his holiest site. But Netanyahu tells UN Security General Ban Ki-moon he's determined to maintain the status quo for the holy site. Now, earlier in the week, when an Israeli-American activist spoke out against the prayer ban, he was shot and seriously wounded. Now, the Palestinian man suspected of shooting uh, was killed by Israeli police, which in turn caused an eruption of violence between Israeli police and Palestinians. This led to Netanyahu's decision to close the Temple Mount for the first time since 1967. Wow. In an effort to prevent further violence, uh, he also called for calm and restraint. 
Well, the recent raid on the mosque and Filan's presence at the holy site drew strong criticism from the Muslim people. One woman expressed a common sentiment saying, the Zionist extremists raided Alaska Mosque and they did not let us enter to pray. This is our mosque, it is our right, it is part of our religion and we will not give it up, she said. Palestinians are not the only ones condemning the recent raid on Alaska. Uh, Iran has denounced the attacks as brazen desecration of Islamic sanctities. Foreign Ministry spokesman uh, Marzi Akfam uh, condemned Israel for reinforcing segregation rules on Muslim pilgrims. She pointed out it is obvious violations of international law. Uh, she also urged international bodies and the international community, mainly Islamic states, to take swift action against Israeli atrocities. Now, the European Union has also put out its own warning against any, quote, provocation at Alaska Mosque. Now, earlier, the 28-nation group had urged full respect of the holy site. Israeli forces defiantly stormed the holy site for three consecutive days, attacking Palestinian worshipers. Israeli forces fired tear gas and rubber bullets, injuring several Palestinians during the attack at the Muslim holy site since Sunday. Well, the violence continued as Palestinian leaders called for a day of rage. Uh, throughout the West Bank and Jerusalem, anger was apparent, including in Ramallah, Hebron, and Nablus. Three Palestinians were injured near uh, there, according to the local Red Crescent movement, which of course it partners with the Red, Red Cross. Cross. Yeah. Well, traditionally Friday, the Muslim Day of Prayer is a day of Palestinian protest, but this one was much more violent than usual amid tension over Alaska Mosque complex. Now, there were also plans by Israel to allow security forces to open fire on anyone who was seen throwing stones at Israeli vehicles. In efforts to limit the threat of violence on Friday, Israel banned access to the Temple Mount for all men under 40, which meant many Palestinians prayed in the streets. Well, the Palestinian chairman, Mahmoud Abbas, says he plans to drop a bombshell at the end of his upcoming speech at the UN. Some Palestinians think he might announce his resignation, and others think that he might cancel the Oslo Accords mm -hmm. yeah, uh, or suspend security agreements with Israel. Well, he told an Arabic paper in London that he was not going to reveal the nature of this bombshell, and he is scheduled to address the UN General Assembly on September 29th. Sources close to Abbas says he plans to resign at the end of the year, but others, of course, are denying those reports. Imam Ali, the first Shia Imam, who is long dead, is going to be worshipped in an upcoming anniversary celebration in Iraq amidst the fighting that has been taking place. Well, security forces have promised to ensure safe procession. Iraq Interior Spokesman Saad Ma'an said Imam Ali's martyrdom has had a big impact on our souls and we visit his shrine every year despite the escalating security situation. Well, millions will visit the holy city of Najif uh, to visit the shrine of the first Shia Imam. Even though the week started off with what some call a bloodbath of violence, it hasn't stopped people from making the journey to visit the shrine. With hundreds of prisoners escaping from Abu Ghraib prison due to an attack which ISIS, of course, is claiming responsibility for, that has raised a fresh wave of unrest and insecurity as people prepare to celebrate the Imam's anniversary. Because of the migrant crisis, European leaders have called an emergency meeting to address the issue. Well, thousands are pouring into Europe wanting to get to Germany, but Hungary isn't letting them through, and the situation is getting violent. Hmm. Hungarian riot police attacked migrants trying to cross over. Now, some of the migrants say they were told they were going to be let through, but that turned out to be a lie. Others say it was an attempt to break through the barriers by force. Uh, there were men, women, and children involved in this latest clash with Hungarian police, and many of those walked away bloodied and bruised as a result of the clashes. Water cannons and tear gas were being used to send a clear message to migrants that there would be no crossing at this border. One Syrian mother had to seek help for her baby, whose eyes were swollen shut from tear gas as she struggled to breathe. But medical attendants on the scene assured the mother the baby would be okay. Unlike Hungary, neighboring Croatia promised safe passage for migrants. 
News of that overwhelmed border crossings as over 9,000 migrants crossed in just 24 hours. Now, whenever a bus did arrive, people rushed to get on it while police try to maintain some kind of order. Well, adding to already tensed matters, police insisted women and children be separated from the men, even if that meant splitting up families. Now, the road ahead is unclear and as of now, out of their control. Mm, that'd be frustrating. Well, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad spoke recently about the ongoing crisis in Syria, saying it is like the West is crying for the Syrian people with one eye and staring down the barrel of a gun pointed at them with the other. People are leaving Syria because of the terrorist and the terrorism. He continued, when you have terrorism, you have destruction of the infrastructure. And when you have that, you have no means of living. So many people leave because of terrorism and because they want to continue living in some other area of the world. And as we recently reported, uh, over half the population there in Syria have left their homes. Right. They've been displaced. Well, the upcoming papal visit to the United States is sure to be filled with a lot of glitter and glamour. But victims of clergy abuse will be watching with a mix of skepticism and doubt. One man, Bernie McDade, was left with little hope as he met with the former pope uh, in 2008, hoping that something more would be done concerning the abuse within the Catholic Church. He said he was left cold by the abuse and the church's response. He said in the interview, we had hope that day that they would perhaps do something. Victims and activists want Pope Francis to directly address the issue when he visits Philadelphia. Now they see this as an opportunity to bring about reform and prevent future abuse. Well, they also want the Pope to punish bishops who cover up abuse cases and globalize a law that will require bishops to report abuse cases to law enforcement. Now, the Pope stresses a zero tolerance uh, policy regarding abuse, but their canon law, that is the Catholic canon law, allows bishops to retain priests involved in abuse, despite the reports that have come in from the victims and others. It's completely up to the bishop's discretion hmm. as to how they handle that matter. Well, Mr. McDade said he doesn't think this pope will address this problem of abuse and says that he'll carry a lifetime burden that he will carry on long after the pope returns to the Vatican. Mm, he's probably right. On Pope Francis's U.S. tour, he plans to address Congress and meet with President Obama. But others wonder what type of reception will he get from other Catholics. Some believe a schism is developing between Pope Francis and conservatives. Francis has spoken out on capitalism, and he has said a revolution is needed to fight climate change. He's been very soft on homosexuals and have made it easy for couples to get their marriages annulled. We just recently reported on that as well. So on his visit to the U.S., there'll be a lot of questions of him concerning what he really believes, and if, as reported, a schism is growing within the Catholic Church. While some Catholics and others might like what he says concerning marriage and abortion, others won't be so joyous when he offers criticism concerning an economy that leaves others behind. Well, the Pope's statements have created bittersweet emotions amongst critics when he says things like atheists should follow their beliefs and the Quran is against violence and by pushing liberation theology. Well, in a Gallup poll, a recent Gallup poll this year, it shows support for Pope Francis among American Roman Catholics has fallen. fallen. That's right, going down. Well, the nations are preparing for war and the Pope makes his push, bringing about a very confusing image of what's right and wrong. Only Israel Hawkins and the House of Yahweh is clearly pointing this world in the right direction. The Pope and the Catholic Church's ratings are falling, while Yisro Hawkins and the House of Yahweh is being lifted up for all the world to see as a light and pathway to peace for all people. Time is running out for you to acquire this most valuable knowledge, the laws of Yahweh, the peaceful solution. Don't wait. Contact the House of Yahweh today and a request to be put on the mailing list and to get your free copies of the monthly newsletter and the Prophetic Word magazine. Here's how. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at The House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. 
You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites, www.yahweh.com, www.yeshawhawkins.com, or www.yahwehsbranch.com. You can also check out our new website, www.ypnnews.com. And to email the House of Yahweh, send your emails to info at yahweh.com. And for any calls outside the United States, please call the number on your screen. Well, don't go anywhere. Up next, the one authorized to bring forth light and true peace to all the world, Yisro Hawkins. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Katan Alexander. I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching.